Welcome to Greenlit, the Buffalo 8 podcast. I'm your host, Matthew Helderman, and each week we're going to dive into a different piece of content, film and television, and we're going to talk with some of the biggest names in front of and behind the camera as we dive deep into how they were financed, produced, developed, marketed, and the crazy stories behind how many of them got made. Welcome back to another episode of Greenlit. On today's show, we're chatting with Kim Winther. Kim is an assistant director and co-producer on films like Independence Day, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, I, Tanya, and television projects like Westworld. Kim was one of the first people I met in the entertainment business as he was an alumnus of the same school that I went to, Lake Forest College. Kim has been a great friend and mentor, giving me guidance and advice as we built Buffalo 8 and Bondit. Kim's been in this industry for 30, 40 years at this point, and his stories and access are unparalleled, having worked with some of the biggest names in the business, including people like Brad Pitt, Tom Cruise, Mel Gibson, and others. On today's episode, we'll dive deep into his background and experience working on set of three different projects being Greenlit, a studio film with Mr. and Mrs. Smith, as well as a little bit of background on Independence Day, and then an independent film with I, Tanya and Margot Robbie and her production company. And then also on a television project with Westworld and how the project was developed and eventually greenlit with HBO. So without further ado, enjoy this conversation with Kim Winther. Welcome back to Greenlit. Uh, Today I'm chatting with Kim Winther. So first off, Kim, thanks for taking some time to, to chat with me this afternoon. Sure, my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. So just to set the table really quickly, I've known Kim for about 10 years, which is crazy to say now. And Kim was one of the first people I met in the entertainment business. Kim was a graduate of Lake Forest College, where I went to school as well. Um, And Kim was introduced to me through the alumni network of our college. And Kim has had a really illustrious, fascinating career working with people like uh, David Cronenberg and Tom Cruise, uh, making films like Independence Day. Uh, Westworld, and I, Tanya. And today we're going to talk about a little different format. So today we'll structure it a little bit differently than we have in the past. Today we're going to talk about how three different pieces of content got greenlit and three very different pieces of content. And that's one of the things I've always loved about Kim is his ability uh, to evolve and adapt and to, you know, chuck and jive. Um, so we're going to talk about how a studio film got greenlit with Independence Day and maybe a little bit of Mr. and Mrs. Smith as well, if, if we have time, how an independent film got greenlit with I, Tanya, and then how a television series got greenlit with Westworld. So I'm happy to juggle those however you see fit, Kim. If you want to start with the studio film and, and sort of take us in order, happy to do it that way or happy to work in reverse, whatever you prefer. Well, I don't know. Let's get the memory banks going here. Um, Let's start with, I guess, the feature film world, which would be uh, like Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Uh, We were working with New Regency at the time with um, Sanford Panic and uh, David Madelon at the helm. And we had just finished, uh, I think it was The Patriot or something with Roland. And I got a call to go meet with the studio about a film called Mr. and Mrs. Smith. And I had to meet a a director, and the director was Doug Lyman. And um, we... They were a little leery about it, but I went and met with Doug. And uh, my first thing as an assistant director is get to know the director as a person and vice versa. And uh, and then understand his methodology and how he wants to work. And as an assistant director, I try to adjust to how his methodology works and help him uh, with his process to be successful. And that's probably the best tool to have as an assistant director is to be malleable, flexible, and really understand who you're working with and also understand the director's needs in concert with the studio's needs bureaucratically. They have a lot of requirements in their departments, heading from budget to financing to publicity, you know, to marketing and to post. So you have to kind of understand all those elements. And what you try to do, which I've been doing in the past, which a lot of assistant directors have been able to do, not many, but uh, a few, you get involved very early and you kind of come in if you ha- because of your 10 or 12 years of AD and possibly to get involved in the early phases of the scheduling, the budgeting and the, mar- and the process of visual effects, et cetera, to get involved early, not coming in six weeks out, you come in 12 or 18 weeks out and you come in as a 
maybe an assistant director, co-producer kind of element where you can actually help steer that one game plan all the way through. And what happens sometimes is you get a, you inherit a schedule and you have to find a way to make that work. And sometimes it's, it's, it's budgeted with different priorities in mind. In this case, it's with a director and some very strong actors. And your goal is to create, you have to kind of create like a zone defense where you make sure that you cover everything and no one's going to go long on you, where things get out of control, where you go over budget or you go over schedule. So you try to create that game plan that makes everybody comfortable. And you do that very early in prep and you be very conservative because you have to understand you're dealing with human nature. So when you schedule or budget a movie, you could say it's, in that particular case, it's like 85 days, but you had to put in about 20% of the unknown, which is human nature, uh, whatever illnesses or hiccups you have, you have to be prepared for those. And, and then when you present that to a studio, um, they, they have their own sort of padding system as well. But if you understand that and then everybody gets on the same page with that, you then create a great atmosphere where everybody is in the process together. And in Mr. and Mrs. Smith, there was a lot of people involved and you become like this Zen master to, to basically ex- understand the writer's needs, the director's needs, the producerial needs. And if you find a way to amalgamate all those people into one room, pre-production meeting, this dialogue then becomes the, the team huddle all the way through the process. And in this particular case, Mr. Smith was two years of process, but because of all of the elements of that particular film, historically and, and emotionally, we were constantly, you know, exploring to making the film better and better. And, and, uh, and because of cast schedules, we had to stop a few times. But in the end, that film became successful because everybody worked together on the same page. You know, actors included, and uh, so that—that's the journey you want to take, so that the director and the producer and the studio are happy with the result at the end, and that's what you want to see is satisfaction uh, and no fear. Uh, all that's been dispelled by taking on all the challenges and, and, and making them work. It's a lot of hard work, but it's also very gratifying. So, the key is when you shoot the film, you have to make sure that you also have the respect of gathering all the elements that are needed to after finishing a film where they're going to need all the elements to shoot the making of, the marketing side, the post side. And, you know, you know in post there's going to be some changes in tone, et cetera. And you have to make sure you get all those elements so they have choices to make too. So those are part of the processes that are in a studio film that you really have to acknowledge and and respect that you can't just be you know you can't be narrow-minded and just think about just the director but you're actually there protecting the director to make sure he or she gets all the elements that she needs and he needs to make the film successful not just for for her or him but also for the studio because they need all those tools to help get this film to where it is that was then uh for studios then and that was uh how it kind of works it's a much longer process and it's also very demanding, um, dealing with a lot of egos and, and also a lot of fears and requirements that people want to make sure they keep their job. So you really have to respect all those processes and you have to kind of put your ego in your back pocket and just accept, I'll make this work for everybody. I don't think a lot of ADs do it that way, but that's how I do it. So I can have mm. fun with it and enjoy it. You want to get up every morning to go to work. So you kind of create that environment for everybody because four in the morning, you have to be motivated or work all night to be motivated. So you kind of have to create that passion. So for a studio film, be ready for a challenge, but also in the end, the satisfaction is really great because A, the director will hire you again. The studio will hire you again because they realize that they can count on you. And then in my case with, with that particular entity, I was there for 10 years. I did a lot of films for them and I had a great journey on all of them. And it was a great, feeling of trust with everybody. But as always, things change. So that whole regime has moved on. But that's, that was that experience. Can, that, I, can, I, can, I, can I pause you for one second, Kim, on, on Mr. and Mrs. Smith? Yeah. I remember a story, and I don't mean to cut you off because I want to continue and I want to continue on that I idea. Mean, I'll just keep going. I know. You told me a story once. This was years ago. Uh, I think we were actually sitting in that office you're sitting in now. And you told me a really awesome story I always remember and I was blown away by it that sequence in mr and mrs smith the, sh- the house scene where there's the shootout 
that you yeah. actually had to go back and do reshoots and yeah. I think completely redestroy a home because it was all actually a home. I think Pasadena, if my yeah. memory serves me, would love that story because I think that story is such a fascinating difference between independent world versus studio world and being able to do something like that. Well, the thing was, for that particular scene, the house in Pasadena only gave you a certain amount of days to shoot there. So we realized that we had to really just shoot all the exteriors, including the chase, you know, down the street, and also find, you know, shoot other houses on this street for when they have to escape. And then the house itself, we actually built an entire replica of it on the stage at Fox, interior, exterior, and the backyard, because... And, and the, also the area where the garden was and the, the, the safe house that he had at the base. We shot that. We redesigned the whole house on stage. So we meticulously shot all the exteriors that we knew that we'd need, plus POVs out the windows. And, and then we went and replicated everything on stage because we knew we had to destroy it and then eventually blow it up. So we shot in sequence and uh, we shot... Uh, the house, most of the interior work is all done on stage, and we shot everything where it's clean. And then we um, went into the, the shootout, but we'd already shot some of the shootout outside with windows and gunfire, etc. So we had to, inter sort of had to intercut that. We then shot the interior and then destroyed it. And then we had a scene where we had the aftermath where the house is blown up, and we shot a model of the house being blown up. We went to uh, another house on past, in Pasadena on the same street with, and set up a destroyed house where we had debris and burning uh, structure all around this person's backyard, and, they, and we shot that in Pasadena on the outside. So that particular sequence involved four different places. And it, you know, it was a challenge to, to do that, but the fact that we could actually build the entire house into your exterior and shoot a backyard on stage for day and night with, with foliage and greens and everything. That was a tremendous amount of money because we realized we couldn't actually do what we want to do in the location. So that's how you adjust. And that was a massive, you know, situation, you know, uh, of building that and then destroying it. I love it. There's, there's the second question I wanted to ask is one of our team members here at Bondit found in the research process of prepping for this, this conversation that you have an acting credit in Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Yeah, I do. <laughs> you, you, did you, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, you played Mr. I think it's Mr. Smith's father is, is the name of the character. I, we did a scene that's not in the movie uh, where they get married. And um, we did a scene where I played uh, Brad's father and uh, we hired an extra to play my wife and Brad to grow a beard. So I grew a long, as long a beard as I could. And uh, we shot this in the warehouse in the city of industry and created a, basically, it's like going to New York City's mayor's office and getting a, a license. And then uh, Angie had her uh, makeup and hair person as her parents. And uh, we just did an improvised scene and we shot it, but it didn't make the movie. So, um, but it did make People Magazine. So that was the key part. And uh, yeah, it was, you know, it was a fat, that was my acting. And I just sort of improvised and said, welcome to the family and, and got a couple of hugs and kisses out of the deal. And then, uh, but there was no other scenes. Does this, does this scene exist anywhere, Kim? I mean, did you ever see it? Uh, did it ever get cut together? Uh, it did get cut together. Yeah. I mean, Doug, Doug was a, Doug is a great editor in his own right. And he, you know, he had put it in there as, as he does with anything. He adds the sauce to his films all the time. And so I don't know. I don't, it did, never got in there. It did the making up. I don't know, but, there, I, you know, there are stills of it, and uh, you know, the stills man sent me one still, and then of course, People Magazine covered it. So I still have a couple of pictures of, of us, these family pictures, but they're under lock and key. So uh, the, yeah, that's the fun part of it. Um, the only other acting credit I had was I played a Klondike trapper on a long film called Death Hunt many years ago, and I. And I failed miserably because I, my job was to come out and say they're here, they're here as 18 dog sled teams come into the village. And so I came out, <laughs> looked over the tent pole and I fell down and I got up and I had snow over my fake beard. And I said, they're coming to come, but I couldn't see my face. It was covered in snow. And so they cut, but they couldn't cut the 18 dog teams that were coming into the village 
on fresh tracks of no snow. So they had to turn them around, which was impossible. So we lost five hours just to my fuck up, to my screw up. Uh, so that was when I didn't want to do it again. And that was part of my acting career with, with Smith versus Smith. So that was, that's as far as I got with that. I love it. Die in front of the camera. I don't know how actors can do it with everybody watching you. I don't know how you can, you know, divorce yourself from people staring at you, but I admire actors who can do that because I certainly couldn't. That's a good segue because I want to ask the sort of yeah, big yeah, million dollar question on this movie and Mr. And Mrs. Smith in particular. Working with Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie, it doesn't get much bigger, although I, I guess we'll, we'll come back to that because you work yeah. with just about everyone who is that sure. big. Mm-hmm. The process of working with the both of them, what was that like? They're great. They're, what's great about most of the actors today, and Brad and Angie included, you know, over the years, uh, they, they respect the crew, they respect the process, and uh, they are um, they're A players who understand the work, and they're always prepared to work. And, and again, that's, you can't ask for anything more than that. And they come prepared, and, uh, you know, there was never any issues you know, there might be some delays here and they're running late by 20 minutes on something, never anything totally dedicated to all that. And then also very aware of the process. You know, they, they understood the scheduling and they understood the making of and, and very much cared about mm. their So from my point of view, I can't ask for, for anyone anything better than that. And, and again, one-on-one relation, one-on-one conversations, not a lot of uh, not a lot of fussing or messing, just, just they're dedicated and they were totally respect what the crew has to go through. So they never really, you know, there was never any of that selfish stuff. It was always just, we're here to work and let's make a good movie. And uh, that's sort of where it was. And there's always creative differences. There's always going to be issues. But in the end, there was always a solution to it, you know, no matter what. And uh, that, and again, they were also dedicated to the process of, you know, what the director's wants and needs are. And they, again, there was always a difference of opinion sometimes, uh, which are, are meritable. But that's, when you have those situations, it's not because of anything more than just they care. And when you see an actor or an actress getting, you know, getting upset about something or they have an argument about something, that's, you, that's actually a good sign because they actually care about what they're doing. Apathy is the worst thing to have on any movie and uh, there was never that them. And, and that's, as you can see, has been shown in its and its success, and um, it's great. That's 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 how I can say that. One one more question on on Mr. And Mrs. Smith before we move on. I want to tie it back into Independence Day that you yeah. made with Roland Emmerich in '95. Yeah. So production in '95 versus production in Mr. And Mrs. Smith 2004. How much changed in the studio world even between those you know, 10, 12 years? How much different was the process of Independence Day is a big studio movie with movie stars versus 05 with a big studio movie with movie stars. Well, I can take that to another level too. I mean, both those films were with Fox and again with, with Roland Independence Day, that was just an amazing experience in its own right, uh, where you, again, we were just learning visual effects, just getting into it. And, and Roland was a champion and an innovator in that world as always. But, you know, again, uh, a director like Roland, you, know, you get the, the freedom to move forward to shoot the film without a lot of studio interference in, in mm-hmm. regards to let me do this phase first and then we'll get to phase two and phase three. And then again, with his team, we were always very, you know, you know very um, supportive of the marketing process and very supportive of the, of the visual fo- and posting process. But again, Creatively, everything was pretty much worked out before we started filming. So that's, that was the refreshment on that. And that story is still, the most amazing thing about that story still is, uh, you know, the Winnebago's in, in, uh, in Ben Wendover. And we had over 500 Winnebago's on the desert and uh, accumulating all that and, and, and all those kind of challenges where so much was practical. And um, we were out there and, you know, just you know, in the desert with 500, maybe, maybe even 700 Winnebago's. I don't know what, we all cut and went over. And then we, we had to take this caravan that was almost five miles long, single file down the 40 out into the desert and then send them deep. And then we had to set our six cameras and then we say action. And we didn't know how long it was going to take them to get to us, but they eventually did. But that was an amazing, that was a one take. I mean, you see that movie where Will's dragging the alien and those, and, Randy Quaid shows up. That was, we got that in one take. Whereas 
would be 350 Winnebago's got to the camera. The other 150 went off to catering because they thought that was where the camera was. So the, the Buffalo Stampede in base camp with Winnebago's, but we still got the, you know, just stuff like that makes it extraordinary. So that in itself, the scale was different because you didn't have the, you know, the, the visual effects component ironed out yet minus the spaceships. So all those sets were built at, uh, were massive sets and they were built, you know, in the, uh, where the Hughes uh, place used to be in, in Marine Del Rey, which is now all condominiums and stuff. So that's the beauty of that. And that can segue into when we did Stargate with Roland, the same thing. It was massive scale. You couldn't clone the extras the way you wanted to. You couldn't really clone the Winnebago's. Movement and visual effects weren't as ex- were, were not totally fine-tuned yet. And then in, in 05, again, you shoot, again, that's, uh, that's a tentpole movie in its own right that grew as a, as a sort of a spy versus spy. If you think being a spy is, is, is tough, try to be married. That was a different level of filmmaking. It wasn't tentpole, big giant effects. That was really a, you know, a, a, a character study. So that the, the level of the, the independence day is all about aliens and attacking. So the big thing in Mr. Mississippi is about the actors. So right. that's the dichotomy there of dealing with that. And then obviously with Mr. Mr. Smith, what hit us was the, was the whole other issue that was going on at that time. So what evolved out of that was a huge paparazzi issue. So we had to put a lot of money into hiding and protecting the cast from paparazzi. So we had a separate crew hanging black. That's where we were. I mean, hanging the big giant uh, camo and giant tarps and tried to hide all that stuff from the people and eventually we had to move all of our operations into a giant warehouse including our sets because we couldn't be outside helicopters paparazzi so you know the grip department and and all the camo that we had to get to hide them was just getting too expensive so we had to go inside so we did all that and then um that again the studio was very much involved in uh giving us uh, first cut, let's look at the fruit stuff, let's go do a reshoot. So I think in, in the rolling world, we would do, after the first, when, when Rowan would finish his cut, we'd also do some more reshoots, but they weren't as extensive. They were just what he needed. But for Mr. Smith, there was tone changes. So we, had to, we actually reshot the ending twice <laughs> at the Ikea. And then we shot a couple of epilogues uh, of the movie in Italy, which was, isn't in the movie. So again, that's a whole different marketing plan. And um, that was highlighted by a lot of publicity. And then you look at, you know, 2012, 2013, with All You Need Is Kill, or the um, thing we did with Doug in, in, in England. Ed, edge, of, edge, of, edge, of, edge of Tomorrow. Oh, well, yeah, I call it. I still call it All You Need Is Kill, Edge of Tomorrow. That film, again, the next, I'll just pass into that next element is Previs. And you have all this Previs, even when I did X-Men, I did X-Men in London as well, where Previs was already pre-approved and designed and you'd work off the previous. So Fox with, with X-Men first class, we got, here's the previous. We're going to work with that. That's our ending. So we already knew what that was and we would shoot what that previous looked at minus a few dialogue scenes, but the line part of the visual effects was already worked out and budgeted and planned and creative and already creatively approved. So you had the flying submarine and all that stuff at the beach. That was all given to me six or seven months in advance so that becomes more of like building a car you know you're going to a factory to build this model so that's how it extended itself and that even happened with edge of tomorrow when in leaveston where we had the same thing massive previs and we would match the previs all the way through and be much more medicinal in filmmaking still creative with script and character to a point but again the you know the 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 what you guess you would call it the um uh, the markers or the uh, the anchors to each act, each sequence was already established. Right. So you had a rough, pretty good budget idea how big of, how big this was going to cost. And well, let's let's go now forward to Itania and talk about how different making of an independent film and greenlighting of an independent film is and was, and also juxtaposed to what you just talked about with the previs and the ability to have such a such a deep pocketed uh, anchor behind you with a studio versus an independent finance project. 
Well, the independent process is a lot of fun, but you have to accept the fact that your paycheck's going to be a little bit smaller. And, uh, but you go with passion. You know, you go with the passion of it. You don't do it just because you need a gig. You do it because you want to do it. And it's refreshing because if you've done a lot of effects films, which are awesome to do, uh, it's sometimes great to just do, do a biopic or something like that. And, and so this film came across my, sort of my desk. I told you, on another film, just a friend of mine called me and said, would you be interested in this about Tanya Harding? And so you go, really? What is that all about? And they send you the script and you go, my God, I had no idea this is what the true story was. And then you meet Margot and you meet Tom and the Lucky Chap folks. And then you meet uh, the director, Craig Gillespie, who's a brilliant director, uh, who understood, he's a shooter and he's done a lot. He understood, everybody understood the restrictions that we had. So it was like a 30 day shoot and shooting in Atlanta, small, and everybody dropped all of their accoutrement, all of their items they needed that they usually get on big films and say, we have to do this for this amount of money, let's do this. And that's what we did. And then you look at that game plan and you have to prove to the financiers that you can do it in that amount of time. And so you look at the, the you have to be realistic and say, okay, well, I don't know how we're gonna do it if we don't, have some sort of game plan before you hire most of the crew. So in your early prep, you, you create, you know, it's a smaller group of people. So in this case, we would have our director, our DP, and our production designer, and it'd be one producer, not three, and one main producer. And we all get in a van and we would explore all the locations quietly. This is way early in prep, where you almost kind of bring your DP in on a non-exclusive basis. And you, you lock in all the locations and you create your playbook and, uh, and you basically lock it all in. You pick them, you approve the locations, and then you schedule around that. And then you find out, for example, we find a location that supplied, it's an abandoned building and Craig found um, eight or nine locations in one building. So when you look at 12 or 15 scenes, there was, we did them in like two days. And each one was a different part of the movie. And, and he also disciplined himself with a playbook where he said, can give me the weekend? And he would sit there with a DP and he would then he said, here is the playbook. This is my shot list for the whole movie. This was two weeks out from shooting. And you can go with that. It might change 10%, but this is where I'm going to go. So let's go with this. So can I distribute to people? Yes, you may. So everybody had a playbook. And he stuck to that. And we got it all done. And he was, when he said it was one shot, it was one shot. He maybe would, he would nibble on my ear about, I might need a little bit of this or that. And okay, I said, yes, fine. So you have this tremendous leader who would compromise when he needed to, but he would also know what he needed. And he found a way to shoot stuff where he actually knew in the end he could save and post and he'd do in post. So whatever he spent in shooting for budget reasons, he knew already in post he could get it done quicker. And then what he also had, which is something that independent people do a lot more now, they have a really good playback system and a video playback person who's also a quasi-editor for him because he was a commercial shooter. So what you do is he could cut stuff as he was going. And so he could see what he needed and what he didn't need, especially if he shot something four days ago, he's already pre-cut it. So he knows what his transitions are. So he said, I don't need this because I got this. So there was a constant multi-layered process of prep shoot cut prep shoot cut so his he was able to have a pretty good sense of the movie with some and he put in some uh temp music he, he could show the investors very early what this film was looking like mm. and then argo is her own you know her own producer and she would you know make sure that she was you know she would waver turn around all those necessary things to keep you in line to keep working and that's the trick of that. And then you do the hard stuff first and you would do the skate, all the skating first. And we just use like two different ranks. And then what you do is you prioritize the, the most difficult stuff first and you prioritize what you know you need in the movie. Not what you want, but what you need. So you make sure each day you've got like the four page scene first or whatever the most important element is. So the rest of the day is somewhat like gravy or if I don't get it, it's okay. So directors, so when I use that as a template for any direct other films I've done, Wakefield and, uh, you know, uh, uh, Nixon meets, Elvis meets Nixon, you know, the, the thing with Kevin Spacey and, and uh, Michael Shannon, same 
same kind of deal. These 30 day shoots, you have to kind of steer the director into making sure he or she shoots what's the priority that day. And most of the time it's the dialogue scenes with their covers because you know they're going to be in the movie. And that weaves the story together. If you run around and shoot all the other one eighths or this or that, and you don't spend the time for these dialogue, these most of these films are like dialogue or like dialogue related anyway, you're going to have an issue. So Miss I, Tanya was that. And Craig got everything. And um, so when you see the cut and all those interviews, some of those were actually bonuses. They weren't even in the script. So that's how you discipline yourself to do that. And if you have a director who will, you basically it's this, you, you call audibles. If you can call an audible and you're ready to do that, that just makes it better. And you, but you create an environment that you can do that. For example, the building with eight or nine locations in it. And you, as an assistant director, you think out of the box. You say, you know what, Craig, you can do this over here too. Oh yeah, I can. So when you learn the director's style and his, how he wants to work, you then merge with that. And you go, you know, this is, and you participate with that. And then that creates uh, this wonderful osmosis where the five people that started this thing are always there together every morning. And we, we, we kind of, it's, it's, it's like, uh, you know, it's, it's like a little regiment. You go off and cover this and cover that. And there's no ego there involved. It's everybody just trying to get it done. And that included Margot too. I mean, we did the, she did 25 pages in one day. As we, <laughs> we did that in prep. We did the whole, like we did in Mr. Mr. Smith. We did the interview first thing in prep on a prep shoot day just to get the feel of who she is with the makeup. And then at the end of the movie, we did it again. In a different location, we ran the same interview again. And she looked different, but she also had taken the journey through the movie of who she was. And then we pick which one was the best, and I was the second one was the best. So those are some of the things you do. And you, uh, Ms. Ms. Smith just doubled back the same thing. We did the interview on day one, where they were actually nervous. They hadn't worked together before, and they were very nervous. And we just rolled the cameras. And then at the end, let's do it again and let's finish the movie that way. And then, of course, we did. And that was shot in 30 minutes at some <laughs> location in Van Nuys. But that's, that's the beauty of independent filmmaking. Is it's all character primarily and added little effects here, here and there. But that's the beauty why I like doing independent sometimes because it is about something real. And it's the romanticism of filmmaking is revisited. And you're shooting dialogue scenes and character pieces. And then accented with the visual effects where needed and in today's world visual effects are so good you don't even know if they're even effects sometimes so effects actually come in to help you with scale and you can't afford in the old days with 50,000 extras etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. so that's the beauty of independent and then the financers just to finish up they're so afraid of any sort of changes or budgets and so you have to make them feel comfortable because you want them to do this again yeah so you have to educate them. Some of them are just, they, they, they drop the money and they take their fee and they move on. But some really want to be involved. And you have to really try to protect them. And the only way to protect them is to tell them the truth and give them the good news and or the bad news. And, there's, and let them and I try to tell them ahead of time so they can prepare for that. And, and then, you know, then there can be a conversation to solve it. You know, so, so, that's, that's great. That's great. That's yeah, it's excellent, Kim. It's a good segue uh, going on your comment about how how far effects have come yeah. and how much that now helps scale the process. Sure. Let's go. So now we've done studio films. Mm -hmm. We've done independence. Let's go into television and Westworld and a good sort of direct segue with the obviously incredible effects that are involved in this. And I know you gave me the precursor that there's sensitivity around going too, yes. too deep. And we can fully respect that knowing that, uh, that you know, the showrunners prefer that, but would love to, whatever you're able to share about that process and the first two seasons that, that you worked on would love to, to jump into that as well. And how, how that's different from film. Well, the, uh, the best thing I can say in particularly now is because of video streaming and, and what have you now have in, uh, ironically, in series work like Westworld or, you know, any of this, even watching Band of Brothers the other night, I had seen Band of Brothers in a long with my son the other night just to see what that was all about. You have the time to, you have six or seven or 10 episodes. You now have a time to tell the story. Yet you don't have the time to really shoot the story the way you want to, but you have the time to tell the story. So instead of two hours, you've got 10, ten hours. So right. 
what's fascinating about that process is uh, I got turned on to Westworld because of the West of it all, and then obviously the, the genre of, of the Crichton novel. But we did the we did the pilot first, and that was magical because it was about the West, and again, shooting as much impractical as possible. So those elements in the first one, which we got nominated, we got nominated for, was an amazing experience with Jonah directing and Lisa Wright. It was an amazing experience because we had top film people, feature film people involved in that. And all of us, including AD staff as well, really fell in love with the process and the time of how to doing it, shooting it on film. And the actors were all there reminding themselves of what filmmaking still should be. Because at that point, when the first Westworld came out, visual effects had taken over. And the animation process had taken over a lot of the big temple movies. And that genre was dominating the industry. And so the smaller films were, uh, were having some problems. So what Westworld did was it created great characters shot in the real West, which is, you know, up in Utah. And then with smart uh, building you know, anchor sets, went to the old Millie Ranch. We built five or six major sets that were modular. And, uh, and then the story was uh, beautiful writing and great characters. So that's where most of the time where visual effects came in to help add the scale where needed. So, you know, that was, you know, she, you know set extensions. Uh, and then as far as the makeup, that was all pretty much real makeup. But the people in that particular kind had created a great special makeup process with stencils. So it was a shorter time to get stuff ready. But still, you needed time to, to do some of the, you know, the blending of deep cuts in there or body parts. But again, that was uh, a situation where it all worked together, where effects were there to help. So mm -hmm. I mean, special makeup and a set extension. You then, the locations are all created their own world. And then there was a little lull for a while, and then the series came on. And then, uh, again, I was in love with the location part of the, the episode, so I did that. But the, So then season two was all about I took it from beginning to end, and that was getting involved in the, in the writing process. Not the direct line, but as each project got finished, I would schedule them and budget them with the team there, and we would, I would get all 10 of them, and then we'd do a template of like a 145-day schedule and do all of that. And then we would create a game plan, and the tricky part of that was you had to block shoot a lot, and that was always tricky because of the cast. So that gets tricky sometimes. But it, it went, for, I can tell you this, that whole journey in season two with location work, revisiting old sets, rejuvenating characters. Again, there's a kinship involved. Again, a small group of people that kind of steer this thing and set it up. It, is, it was like a eight or nine month process, and it went by like that. Worked every day here in LA and then Utah and other places. It blew by because every day was an enjoyable experience and a fascinating journey of trying to figure things out. And the cast were fantastic. They all, all of us felt lucky to be there. The process is multi layered, with, you know, each episode has its own team, has its own production meetings. It leapfrogs into the next sequences. But it's all also the, the privilege of cheating when you need to cheat and creating. Uh, a landscape that is real, but it's been enhanced. And remarkably, how you shoot is, is fast and furious because that's what you have to do. So we would go to Utah and we would have three or four crews going at the same time and we would be orchestrating all of that in different parts of the valleys or what have you. And it, it, it worked like clockwork, but it was tiring. It was like two in the morning calls. We're going to do this and this. And at 4 a.m., you're going to go here and 8 a.m. there. But we created this unity of doing this like a, like a war effort, getting it all done in seven days. instead of It's like a 10-day shoot in seven days. And when you shoot these episodes, they're really 10 or 12 days, but they're really 20 days. So you have to be clever about that. And you have to, again, each director that came in had to really be prepped and helped and so it became you know uh, sort of a, a labor of love mm -hmm. and you have to expect changes and when they go into editing they might want to reshoot something so you try to find a way to make that work in that area and the whole thing of block shooting is a challenge but it's it works because you you have a situation where you have anchor sets that 
are always there to bail you out or help you tell the story because the audience understands that. But overall, the, it's a grind. It's a really tough grind. And yet you have to get the right people around that are accepting that. And again, it comes back to what I said earlier in this interview. It's about the passion. You have to want to do it. If, you don't, if you're doing it for just other reasons, then, then you're probably in the wrong business. If you, yeah. if you go in there to fight your own anxieties or your own fears, your own fatigues, or why am I doing this? My career's not where I want to be. You're not going to get too far. You have to go in saying this because you got to understand the director and the producer uh, have been on this longer than you have. And this is, this is their moment where they can finally succeed their dreams. So, you know, you, you help get them there. And that's including the TV execs. There's a whole other side of that that you have to support. And that's, again, marketing and the making of and interviews. And uh, it's all of it. You have to support the machine to get everything it needs to promote. And the other thing that's different in TV is there's an air date. You have to right. make this is an air date that's going to hit you. So that's the ticking clock. Uh, and that's a whole different pressure. So there's nothing else you can do, but you have to get it done. So you, you, know, you, you have to set the table uh, safely because that's the other issue in TV. There is a speed involved and you have to really make sure you create, this is for, this is from my perspective. I can't speak for other folks, create an, a, an arena of calmness. People think better that way. And, and also admit that we're all human and we will make mistakes and we will always support if there's an issue, we'll solve it. And in TV, there's a lot of, there's a pacing issue that's always on, that's on your, you know, on the table. You have to always maintain and you have to stay in front of that. You worked with David Cronenberg on the fly in 1986. You then worked with Tom Cruise in 1988 on Cocktail, which I believe was the first time you worked with Tom Cruise. Then Cool Runnings in 1993, which for kids of my generation, it's a really huge, really uh, foundational movie. Then Independence Day in 1996. Then Johnny Tsunami in 1999. Again, very similar to Cool Runnings as a foundational childhood movie. Sure. Then The Patriot with Mel Gibson in 2000. Mr. and Mrs. Smith in 2005 with Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie. Then Edge of Tomorrow in 2014, again with Tom Cruise. I, Tanya in 2017. Westworld 2016, a film that, of course, I have to shout out to that we finally got to do something together with Crazy Finding Steve McQueen in 2000, 2017, 2018, and then Greyhound with Tom Hanks. And so you've worked with some, some, some pretty big hitters in the business over your career. I want to end the whole conversation and interview today with just your favorite you know, takeaway from this great run, but I want to chat about Greyhound. Because as we're recording this, literally, what, a week ago, two weeks ago, the news came out that Apple bought it for $70 million. And how interesting that is that when I think back, your career, your, your first job that we came across, 1980, 1981, uh, working as a second, second AD, and then a second AD in 1981 and 82, Apple was barely even on the map of being a home computing company, a personal computing company. And now your most recent film that's being released, Greyhound, just got bought for $70 million by Apple, who's obviously big in the content business right. as of this discussion. I'm, I, you, you're always someone who's uh, philosophical about the business, but also grounded in sort of just the practical approach you've taken to it. Talk to us a little bit about Greyhound and working with Tom Hanks and maybe any information about the Apple uh, of it all, if, if anything, or even just reflecting on that. Um, gee, well, let's see. Um, I think the best thing about that particular film is obviously the story. It's based, based on a story called the, the Great, I think it was called The Great Shepherd. And, and then Tom and, and his team at Playtime were great. And Aaron Schneider was the director. And Shelley Johnson was the DP. And uh, David Coast, who was a dear friend of mine for many, many years, was the, one of the producers, my producer as well. We shot in Baton Rouge. And... Um, we read it and we said, okay, how many days? We want to do it in like 30 days. And I went, wow, okay, and what exactly is the plan? And, and basically, after a lot of homework with Aaron and with 
uh, with with David and, and Tom and, and Gary Getzman and the gang there, we uh, we came up with a plan where we would shoot the story first. As I said earlier, you shoot the story, and, and a lot of the film takes place in the cockpit, you know, not not the rocket, but in the pilot house of the of the destroyer. So we shot all of that. We shot in order, basically, because it's like if you took something like rope or something, it's all a continuation of something. And so for, for Tom's character, you try to shoot as much in order as possible because that helps him because he's, 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 he's guiding the film without giving away too much. So basically, logistically, we shot it in order. All the stage work on a gimbal. Uh, and we shot it in sequence all the way through. And um, we then, after we finished telling the story, um, we then went to a ship you know, in the, um, in the Mississippi, and we shot some exterior tighter shots of a natural destroyer with Tom and characters going back and forth from the pot house down to, uh, down to the deck, et cetera. So we created that image that we're on a real ship without, ship without even moving. And then the rest of the stuff, everything looking out the windows, et cetera, was all primarily CG and some plates. And that was extensive as well. So, but everything interacting in the pot house was all tied to what was going on outside. So that's, what we did. So in, in end, I think it ended up being like 35 days with five days on the ship and like 30 days you know, on stage in order. So every day um, we'd show up in the pot house dressed and ready to go and we'd run the lines and walk through our day's work. And Tom was the spearhead of all of that. And a remarkable experience and a remarkable time with him. And then Aaron, Aaron and him both had their own relationship where, you know, Aaron was always making making sure we get the right eye lines and, and tell the story of what's going on outside. And then he would, you know, Tom would kind of steer his, his whole persona around interacting with the other actors. So it was a great team effort between the two of them creatively. And then for, for the DP and I and the production designer and, and our background, we had a great, um, we had Dale, Dale Dye in there and we had Kevin Collins. These guys were military guys who understood the process. So they all went into boot camp. So the realism of it all, landed and have you seen Tom's done, you know, the guy produced Band of Brothers and Pacific and he's got he's got another one coming up for Apple later. So that that was the process. And of all things we were in Baton Rouge and you thought, wow, how are we gonna do that? So that's what we did. And it was enjoyable every day. Great positives and again the environment of the privilege to work, we're lucky to be here. And then the ability of no egos there and, and Tom and, and all of us together on the ship there was this whole kind of, we want to make a really cool movie. And that's what you want to do. And that's what that was. Cut to where we are today, I think because of COVID and et cetera, I think that Sony was the, uh, the main uh, distributor for the film. I think that they got caught in a situation where they couldn't release anything theatrically right away. So I think what they felt was that uh, D-Day, let's get this film out now rather than wait another year. or to a different release date, they felt it was more impactful to, to release it this year. And I think it's going to be D Day or something, and that's what seemed applicable. And then obviously uh, Apple and Netflix were involved, and I think Apple and eventually won out. So what that means in our world, I, I can tell you this: uh, I have some friends at Apple. I've done some stuff with Apple already prior to that. I've done some of their sort of top secret, you know, uh, commercials for their some of their products over the years, and it's a fascinating process where you. You, you get an Apple green card and a little credit card and you, and you have to produce some of these things where you go off and you shoot these things all around the world so you realize the power of their financial abilities to get what they want done, but they're very methodical. So that you, what I'm trying to say is you embrace that. You embrace change because that's just what that is. You can't fight it. You can't live in the past with this industry. you got to keep looking forward to it, just like talking to you. We're all story in the bottom line, we're all storytellers. We all want to tell a story. We love what we do. We love the filmmaking process. So what's wrong with that? If it's a different medium, then that's what that is. And so you bring your expertise to that environment and you teach it or you learn it and then vice versa. You train looking back, talking to you and your world. You're fascinated by okay, how can we do movies together? The rules always change, but the stories don't. They're still there. And because of today's technology, you can now tell even better stories without you know, uh, the, the cumbersomeness of shooting in the, in the early days of filmmaking, which is, you know, when you watch the DeMille films and all the King Vidor films and all the films they shot in the 30s and the 40s, you watch those films, they're fascinating how they did them. 
mm-hmm. in short periods of time than using set extensions in their own way. But again, bottom line, telling a good story and people like to watch that. So that's the beauty of Greyhound. It's a, it's a wonderful story shot in a very, very logical, conservative way. And, uh, and again, working everybody in a situation where rules were not involved is what we want to tell the story. How do we tell it with the amount of money we have? And how do you make it successful for, for, for the, the people that were involved, which was, I think, Film Nation was involved, and et cetera. So that's what you do. HBO and HBO, same with HBO and Westworld. You, you want to create a product that's going to be good for people. And so you can't really think about the money side of it. If you do things for money, it doesn't work out. You just do it because you want to do it. So for Greyhound, when it comes out, it'll be fascinating how that works. The algorithms of how it's going to be deemed successful will be interesting because theatrically, it might get out there eventually. It'll look great in the theater, but you know, it'll also it'll do well because it's a great story. And that's the beauty of whatever medium you put it on, people are going to watch something if it's a good story. And, and that's, that's what this will be. I mean, Greyhound will be a great experience for people to look at and, um, and enjoy. And you also want to applaud and encourage the Apple Pluses and the Netflix and the Hulus. They, they, want, to, they want to make movies. And eventually, who knows, maybe they'll end up buying the theaters. I don't know. You know, that, I'm not afraid that the theatrical system will come back. It will, and it'll just get better. But at the moment, we have to adjust. And we have to create you know, people to make movies and, and feel that they're going to make money or else it doesn't exist. So I think in the end, for Apple+, Plus. Um, they're going to do a great job of releasing it. And I think they've got it for like 15 years. And I think then Sony gets it back. So there's some sort of mutual uh, handshake there. That sounds interesting from what I read. So there's a positiveness for everybody on that. And then, and then um, it's also a good time to release something um, with that kind of actor involved. He will, he will create a tremendous amount of optimism out there for everybody. Right. It's needed. Kim, always always appreciate our conversations i want to end with a with a with with your you know, piece of advice that you once gave me and i'm curious if you know, you'll probably laugh that i remember this but i definitely bothered you enough to get a meeting with you initially when i came out to la and i was hey, so no, wide eyed right here on the couch i think right <laughs> i did i did and i was wide eyed and totally green and Loved, loved, loved storytelling, loved film, loved television, loved entertainment, but had to learn your world, right? Had to learn the process of the brick and mortar of actually putting the hard hat on and going to work and getting it made. And I remember you telling me a piece of advice about this business, which was don't feel like you're bothering someone until they tell you you are in this industry. Be willing to extend yourself and reach out and have discussions and ask questions and be passionate and lead with that and people will see that it's genuinely you and that you actually give a shit and you've said that many times throughout this you know this this interview organically i didn't you know prompt that or or we didn't discuss that before this but hearing you echo it so many times brings me back to sitting in that room when i was 21 22 years old having that discussion with you you still feel that same way if you had to sort of sum up the piece of advice you give people making content or thinking about how they're going to make content after the world it comes out of the, the COVID hiatus. What, what, what does that look like? I think, it, uh, I think what it is is, I mean, social media has taken our industry to, to an extreme uh, in, in positive and negative, you know, because, you know, there is manipulation involved. And you have to find a way to trust it. So, you know, that, so that's an environment on its own, right? And, uh, but as far as the technology of, taking a wish fulfillment and going to shoot something of your own. That's fantastic because in the early days you could not really do that much because you had to learn how to operate a film camera and you had to buy a film camera. You couldn't really, or you could rent one maybe. And then you had to buy the film. Whether it's right. and then you had to go to the world of processing it. That's expensive. And the time of all that took forever. So the, the filmmakers world was very small for independent young directors, they would have to go to school or whatever. They didn't have the money to do it. Now it's, it's like the gold rush. It's, it's, it's wild, wild west still. People have the technology to go and shoot whatever they want, anytime they want, and tell their stories. So now the wild card is how do you get them out there, A, and B, how do you make money on them? And that's, that's the 
the area that has to be figured out. And um, so the enthusiastic part of writing a script, shooting the script, and finding someone who's going to finance it and then make sure that, A, that financer gets his money back, but also you get out those people to see it, that's, that's the next sort of, sort of element that has to be worked out is the distribution side of it with a financial return. Because in the old days, and I call it old days now, it's not that long ago, where you know, even our residuals, you, know, you go, the movie gets into theatrical and cassettes, what have you, and then you know, there's, there's huge box office and there's huge this and that. That's changed. And uh, you know, I get checks for $2.33 sometimes, they're classic. So, but they're still coming, but that's because the viewership has dropped. And there's no measuring of that. So the viewership is the key thing I was saying earlier. I don't know where that's heading now, where the interaction of people going to movie theaters together, there's the small landmark theaters of couches and getting served dinner as if you're in your living room at a theater. I don't know if that's a great thing, but walking into a a big theater with with the energy of a crowd watching something like the old Star Wars movies or any of these big movies, do we ever get that again? I don't know. That, that's my thought was maybe we have a shot at that with drive-ins. You know, maybe the drive-ins will do that for us. But again, you can't interact with everybody else's energy and you watch protests and the, the energy of people on the street. That's what you want in a movie going experience as well as the energy of watching this together intimately on your own time in a TV in your house or home with family still is viable, but it's not going to bring in, you know, the financial return that you might want. And the, the ability for financiers to finance movies where they will get their return, that's, I don't have, that's my big question today is how does that work? And, when, and it probably will eventually, but in what dynamic? In other words, what kind of films can you logically finance now? What size can they be? I can hear people, can you do them for $2 million? Can you do them for $3 million? The beautiful thing is filmmakers like us understand all the shortcuts and we'll find a way. A friend of mine did a film for Amazon four years, five years ago, and I, he sent it to me, and it was like a 40-day shoot. He said, well, I want to do it in 14 days. It was a Civil War movie in 14 days. And I said, I don't know how to do that. That was a few years ago. I had no way. I didn't have the weaponry to figure out how to do that. I, so I passed on it. The gentleman went off and shot it in 14 days, but we never saw it. And he said, never again, because he couldn't. It was physically impossible. But he did it, but it didn't, the return story-wise wasn't there. So there's going to be some sort of, you know, no disrespect to the larger entities that will shoot the Marvel films and the big tentpole films. That's a given. Those will, those will profit for everybody, that particular type of filmmaking. But what we're talking about now, the independent films, there's, there's just the ability of how the independent finance is going to make money on a movie what are the elements it needs it has one thing going for just to jump into that is they can get the elements now that they want there's a lot of actors that want to work and they'll work for a certain fee now so there's that who want to work and then also there'll be so you'll get a nice package but then how do you how are you going to release it so if we want to close on the greyhound of it all who knows what that's going to look like no idea uh wide-eyed and hopeful that it will be profitable for everybody and including, you know, the, the, the studio that was involved, including the producers that were involved, including the residuals of it all. If that dynamic works, then they have a tremendous amount of money to make great stuff. And that's the Netflix and the Hulus and the, and the Apple Plus. They have, they, they have tremendous financial power and distribution power. And that's probably where we're going to go. The romanticism of theatrical, I think, is going to be a very tough adjustment to make. And I'm hopeful that, that like vinyl, you know, in, in the world of um, music, that the theaters will come back at some point, but they won't be owned by AMC or anything. They're going to be owned by somebody else. So I look at the positive side of that. That's just a new, there's a new man on the block. They have their financial world. They're independent. They have their own distribution world internationally so that's powerful so i kind of look at it that way and uh, that's the best way to look at it thank you again kim i really appreciate it i know we're, we're up on time and thank you again it's always a pleasure man i'm sure we'll catch up uh, on the other side of this thing we will take care of yourself man thanks for the invite
Okay. Thanks, bye. Jim. Talk soon, dude. Bye. bye. Thank you all for listening to another episode of Greenlit, the Buffalo 8 podcast. For financing questions, feel free to contact us at Bondit Media Capital at info at bondit.us. For production, development, and distribution questions, feel free to contact us at Buffalo 8, info at buffalo8.com. We'd love to hear from you and hope you'll continue listening to the podcast episodes ahead.